right, so I know we have covered a lot of ground when it comes to ancient Greece. We have talked about the origins, we've talked about the plays, the playwrights, the performances, the spaces. We've gone over a lot. There's only one thing left to discuss for the purposes of this class as it relates to ancient Greece, and that is the philosopher Aristotle and his work in pinpointing the major characteristics and elements of drama. Now, you may have heard the name Aristotle before. He is one of ancient Greece's most prolific philosophers. But on top of that, he was also one of the very first theater critics. Now, before we continue on, one thing we got to do is we have to clarify the term critic, especially theater critic. Because as we've already discussed with a lot of terms, it means something very different today than it did when it was first coined. When we think of a critic today, what we think of is somebody who's, you know, in the best of times, their job is to inform you as to whether or not a piece of art is worth your time or money. Is this movie good? Is this television show worth watching? Is this album worth listening to? And so on and so on and so on. Basically, answering the question, should I spend my money on this? Well, that was not the role of the critic in ancient Greece. Okay, First of all, everybody was already going to go see these plays anyway. It didn't matter if they said it was good or not. You were going. First of all, remember, it was part of a religious ceremony. So if you were devout, you were going. And secondly... It's not like there was a whole lot else to do in ancient Greece at the time. So, you know, you were going to the theater one way or the other. So the critic's job was not to, you know, give a thumbs up, thumbs down, 40 stars, brilliant, Oscar worthy, or to be some sarcastic know-it-all reviewing movies on YouTube while he's driving home in his car. The role of the critic, in the simplest terms of ancient Greece, was to use the work that was existing as a jumping off point to talk about greater issues, to talk about new concepts. And they would use the work that they were reviewing or criticizing, however you want to say it, as an example. Okay? Now... If you remember back, way back when we were talking about the playwrights and we were talking about Sophocles, remember he is the author of the Oedipus Cycle, that's Oedipus Rex or Oedipus the King, uh, Oedipus at Colonus, and Antigone. One of the talking points I gave you was that his work, specifically Oedipus, was used as the basis for Aristotle's critical work. So he took the play Oedipus, read through it, analyzed it, and came up with what he felt were the key concepts of drama. He wrote them down in a book called The Poetics. Um, we are not going to go over all of The Poetics. It's, I've had to read it. It's, it's long. It's a little dry. I mean, it's long, relatively speaking. It feels like it takes forever. But, you know, um, but in that book, he made six key points. He identified what he thought were the six key elements of drama. Not only did he identify them, but he identified the order of importance that he felt they should be kept in. According to him, these six elements had to be present in every single dramatic work. And their level of importance had to meet the list that he put them in, the order that he put them in. Now, there was no... Uh, like penalty if you didn't at that time it was more just you wanted as a playwright you wanted to live up to the highest standards you wanted people to think you were the best playwright that's why you were submitting these plays so in the attempts to adhere to this list from such a respected source this is how the plays began to be constructed now two things to keep in mind number one what we have to understand as we go through this list is that, again, all of this was brand new. I know that is really difficult to comprehend, but 
at that time, theater, drama, playwriting, acting, it was all uncharted territory. So sitting down and taking what was the, the brand new thing, this was the TikTok videos of its day, and simply by saying that I'm dating this video, um, taking this new form of entertainment, breaking it down, and saying this is what makes the absolute best TikTok video ever, that was considered revolutionary. So please keep that in mind. The other thing I want you to keep in mind, as we're going through this, please make sure that you are writing these down. You are writing these. You need to know these six elements. All right? You need to know these for testing purposes. So please, please, please make sure that you know and understand each of these six elements. Also, pay attention to the order they are in. Once again, they are going to be in the order that Aristotle felt they were important, starting with the most important and moving down to the least important. Okay? So please, please, please make sure that you know what each one of them is. So not just the, the catchphrase, but what it actually means and the order that they are in. That is very important. All right. So with that in mind, let's talk about Aristotle's The Poetics and his six elements of drama. Number one, the plot. That is the arrangement of dramatic incidents. Now, keep in mind, the plot is separate from the story. Okay? So if we look at a play like Oedipus, the story is that an attempt to rid the city of a plague, the new king has to figure out what became of the old king, eventually finding out that he himself had accidentally killed the king who was his biological father, and then he unknowingly married his biological mother and then blinds himself and becomes a poor peasant out on the street. That's the story. Okay? That's the, the overarching tale. The plot is how we get to each of those points. It is the construction of the story. Bullet point by bullet point. This happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. It's the cause to effect. Okay? A well-structured plot is one of the most sought after things in dramatic writing and according to Aristotle it was the most important thing. You had to have a good interesting well-constructed plot above everything else. Next up on Aristotle's six elements of drama countdown characters that is the people represented in the play. Now this is a point that has drawn a lot of discussion in recent years as theater has evolved from its humble beginnings there are some who would argue that if you have really interesting characters characters that an audience is invested in and they want to see what happens to that that can sometimes make up for a weak plot some people would say that character should actually be number one and plot should be number two but in Aristotle's world, again, the structure of the story was the most important, but just behind it were who were the characters we were going to encounter. Oedipus would not be the play that it is and well regarded as it is if Oedipus himself was not a compelling character. Antigone would not be the fascinating look at political power that it is if Antigone and Creon were not fascinating and powerful and compelling characters in their own right. So according to Aristotle, right after you have a good plot, you need to have good characters to carry it out. Number three, theme. That is the ideas being explored. So when asking yourself about the theme of a play, because we're going to use that term a lot, what are the overarching themes of this piece of work? What we're asking is what are the major ideas being put forth? For instance, if we look at Antigone, the major themes on display in that work is the concept of individual rights versus state rights. 
that is an overarching theme of that play. It is what drives it forward. Oedipus themes, of course, involve uh, hubris, also in, uh, includes defying of divine intervention. So these are the major ideas that are present and that the play is trying to get across. So please make sure you understand that concept because we are going to be talking a lot about the various themes in pieces of work throughout this class. But moreover, according to Aristotle, theme was the third most important thing in a play, that the ideas you had had to be interesting, compelling, and important enough to the populace to warrant their expression within this piece of work. Number four, language. That is the dialogue and the poetry. Now, this is an interesting one to talk about in terms of how much this has changed over the centuries. Now, one of the things that a lot of people have trouble with with early drama, this or what we would call classical drama, that's everything from the Greek theater all the way up to the Restoration, is that it's written in such a way that it makes it very difficult for a modern audience at first glance to get involved with it. It's written in poetry, basically. Well, a lot of that is due to how high Aristotle placed language on his ranking. The idea that you could express your characters through brilliantly written prose and grand metaphor and the most elo eloquent language, which as you can see I already bobbled a word so I'd be out of it, but the ability to do those things was considered a mark of how good of a writer you were. So that is why so many of these plays, and this is going to be something that is going to carry over again for centuries through Shakespeare, through the Restoration. That is why a lot of these plays are written like that, are written in verse and the various rhyming couplets and whatnot. It is because the belief that your ability to write the most beautiful language was evidence of how good of a writer you were. Number five, often surprises a lot of people. But when you think about it, you can see just how important it is to dramatic endeavors. Number five is music. Now remember that Greek theater was born out of the dithyram. It was born out of choral hymns. So singing, musical interludes, these were woven into theater's DNA from the very beginning. Now, when we're talking about music, especially in modern terms, we are not talking necessarily about singing or Broadway musicals. We're talking about how the music is integrated into the story. To understand the importance of music in dramatic endeavors, pose this question to yourself. When was the last time you saw a movie or a television show that had absolutely no music in it. No background music, no one singing along to the radio, no incidental music, speeding up when the action picks up, slowing down when things are sad. When was the last time you saw a movie with no music? I'll give you a great example. The recent horror movie A Quiet Place, in which the whole point of it is that you're not supposed to make noise because the monsters will hear you and come get you. That had incidental music in it. It had background music in it to help set the moods because they couldn't rely on dialogue to do it. And finally, number six, spectacle. This means scenery and other visual elements. If you're not familiar with the term, spectacle basically means, in modern terminology, special effects, the wow factor, the thing that makes the audience's eyes bug out and go, ooh, I've got to go see that because it has this or that in it. Um, for the Greeks, as we mentioned when we were talking about the stage technology, that would be something like the machine, the deus ex machina, going and seeing that, that huge crane lifting people up and down, 
was jaw-dropping. And as we mentioned in that lecture, playwrights began to write their plays to include the deus ex machina, even if it wasn't necessary because they knew the audience was going to get a big kick out of it. Think about this from a modern perspective. How much of our popular entertainment is based on huge, jaw-dropping visuals? Computer images, uh, CGI characters, explosions. How much of what we consume on a yearly basis is driven by spectacle? Think of it this way as well. Broadway, the American musical theater, is completely driven by spectacle. Shows like Phantom of the Opera, The Lion King, Wicked. What you hear a lot of are people coming out of those plays going, oh my goodness, the costuming was beautiful. Oh, did you see that huge dragon? Did you see the makeup? Did you see when the chandelier fell? And then if you ask them, yes, but how was the story? Their response is usually, I don't know. All right, so that is a lot of information that we just got. So a couple things to remember, as I stated at the beginning, I want you to remember all six of those elements, and again, not just the, the catchphrase, understand what they mean in a dramatical sense. What is their purpose in a written work like a play or even a movie or a television show? Also, I want you to make sure you remember the order that they are in. So remember, that's plot, character, theme, language, music, and spectacle. Okay? In that order. But, there is something that I want you to think about, and this is something that I would like to discuss in class, and I would probably guarantee it's going to show up on a test somewhere. So this is something to put some thought into. I want you to think about, what are your opinion of those six elements? How important do you think they are? In other words, if you had to rearrange this list, if you had to put what you think the most important elements in drama are, what order would you put them in? No right or wrong answer here. I'm just curious. What order would you put these in, and why are they in that order? So along with his six elements of drama, there is one other really important theory that Aristotle developed as it relates to Greek tragedy that I want us to be familiar with. And that is the concept of catharsis. You can see it bold and underlined there on the slide. So what is catharsis? Well, let's discuss it. Let's start with the statement there on the slide. It says, Aristotle says that tragedy produces the emotions of pity and fear but that there is a catharsis of these emotions. Catharsis basically means, when you break it down to its core elements, catharsis means a purging of emotions. So if we look back at that original slide, and it said that Aristotle said that tragedy, so the viewing of a tragedy, going to the theater and watching a tragedy, would produce in the audience the emotions of pity and fear. You would feel afraid for the heroes, you'd feel pity for them, you would feel basically a lot of negative emotions. But through the watching of these acts, by watching fictional characters go through these horrible acts, it would purge the negative emotions from the audience that they would leave feeling better than they did when they came in because the negative emotions that they carried around with them naturally had been purged from them. All right, let's think about this concept of catharsis for a moment and let's put it into a more modern context. Now again, it's about purging emotion, that you see bad things happen, but by seeing them happen in a fictional, safe, controlled environment that those emotions are then purged from you and you leave feeling better because you are no longer carrying those negative emotions around with you. Let's think about this. When you go to the movies, 
Let's think about it in a positive context. When you go see a comedy and you laugh, don't you feel a little better after you leave the theater? What about when you go and see a big blockbuster and the heroes all unite to take on the adversary and they win and there's that big triumphant swell? Don't you leave feeling really pumped up? That's the concept of catharsis. Okay? Think about it, now let's go back to Aristotle's way, with the negative form. Think about horror movies. The concept behind modern horror movies is that if you go and you see these horrible acts perpetrated, that you are purging that desire to commit horrible acts or to have bad things happen by watching them happen in a fictional environment. And so therefore, theoretically, you are purged of those emotions. Now, this is important to understand because the concept of catharsis is going to be one of the only things that drama has going for it when it starts to come under very heavy criticism in several centuries' time. Think about it nowadays. Isn't that the opposite people's theory? Whenever something bad happens, whenever somebody does something horrible, one of the first things they always say is, oh, he was playing violent video games. And then the debate starts, did the violent video games make him do it? Or were the violent video games a form of catharsis, a way of purging emotions in a fictional environment so that you aren't encouraged to act on them? This is a debate. It's a debate that's gone on for a long time, and we are going to discuss it in class. So if you don't understand this theory, we are going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about what your views on catharsis are when next we meet. So, with this, we wrap up the ancient Greeks, but there is a lot of history yet to come, and we are going to be moving on from Greece to ancient Rome.